If you were to ask me what I consider to be one of the funniest television shows ever made was, I would answer with Red Dwarf. For six series, this British science fiction sitcom was a gold standard for comedy television, mixing fascinating science fiction concepts with the struggles between Dave Lister, the last human being alive, and his shipmates, the neurotic hologram Arnold Rimmer, the cat, the result of three million years of evolution from a domestic cat, and Crichton, the sanitation droid who over the course of the series learns to break his programming. It's an eternally rewatchable show, and something I grew up with and quote fairly regularly. Step up to red alert. Sir, are you absolutely sure? It does mean changing the bulb. So, like everything else that's popular in British, USA had to try and make their own version, and it was ass. There are actually two different pilots for an attempted USA version of Red Dwarf, but for the purposes of this video, we'll look at the first one, which was shot in 1992. And as will become clear in this video, it was nowhere near the standards of the show that it was trying to be. Gotta get back in time. The year was 1992, and Red Dwarf was at the peak of its popularity. Series 5 had just been broadcast to massive success, not just in the UK, but in the US as well on PBS. However, NBC had set their sights on producing an American spin-off of the hit show, and in partnership with the Universal Studios, which also had their sights on a possible Red Dwarf film, they set about to try and make it happen. Universal approached Red Dwarf creators Rob Grant and Doug Naylor, and production began on what was dubbed Red Dwarf USA, with Malcolm in the Middle creator Linwood Boomer on writing duties and Jeffrey Melman as director, who would go on to direct several episodes of Frasier. All but Robert Llewellyn from the original cast were not to take part in production, and in fact did not know of it until Craig Charles heard about it by accident. I found out about uh, the Red Dwarf pilot from the makeup lady. She was making me up and I said, I said what are you do next time? She's gone over to America with Robbie to do the Red Dwarf American show. However, it soon became apparent that production was going to be troubled. Grant and Naylor were brought to America to sit at a table read for the pilot script and work on it with Linwood Boomer and the NBC executives, and quickly found that their input was far less welcome than they'd anticipated. According to Naylor, when they wanted to address fundamental character issues they had with the American version of Lister, they were told they were being overly negative, and that in essence, their job at the workshops was to provide funny one-liners. By the end of the process, the script in the hands of Universal and NBC was one that Grant and Naylor hated, and in an attempt to fix the show they went away the night before filming was to start and completely rewrote the pilot to better fit the spirit of the original show. This script was rejected by the studios, and despite an attempt by Grant and Naylor to slip their script to Melman behind the executives' backs, the studio shot the script written by Boomer, ensuring that Grant and Naylor had little more on the show than their creative consultant credit, and this would be the downfall of this pilot. The most integral part of Red Dwarf has always been its characters. The show was always at its best when it was working hand in hand with the characters that existed in its universe, such as the brilliant Back to Reality, a half hour deep dive into each character's innermost dreads. The boys from the Dwarf are so well defined by the show that you would think it would be hard to completely miss the mark in characterizing them, but you would be wrong. The worst offender of missing the point of a character comes in the form of American Dave Lister. In the British program, Lister is not your average science fiction hero. He's the lowest rank on the ship. I'm not the lowest rank on this ship. What about the laboratory mice? He's rude, slobby, and mostly pretty lazy, but he also prides himself on being a good man, and the idea of breaking his moral code of conduct appalls him. The charm of Lister is that he's an extremely unlikely hero, a man whose only real goals in life are to get back to Earth and bum around a bit in the meantime. On the other hand, we have USA pilot Lister. There are some similarities. This version of Lister is also depicted as being a bit of a drifter who just kinda wants to have a laugh and is mostly on Red Dwarf just to get back to Earth, which seems to be adapted from the novel Infinity Welcomes Careful Drivers, but this is all somewhat undercut by the fact that this Lister is played much closer to the standard tropes of the science fiction hero. Tall, built, and confident. He's also a lot more self-interested in this version of the show, willing to let his cat Frankenstein die to get a chance with Jakansky, which is just hideously cheap. Playing him in this respect immediately removes a lot of the charm from the character and makes him a lot more boring, and in places a hell of a lot more unlikable. It's also worth noting that Lister seems to have been whitewashed in this version of the show, which is also a point of irritation and actually got worse with the second pilot. It was inevitable that any adaptation of Rimmer was going to fall short of the original. Grant and Naylor had struck gold with the original character, somehow making one of the the most loathsome people to ever walk the universe, a character that was universally loved and frequently the centre of episodes that delved into his improbably twisted mind. This coupled with Chris Barry's consistently brilliant performances makes Rimmer a hard character to adapt, and the US version proves this as this version of Rimmer is 
fatally dull. I wish I had more to say about US Rumor, but I really don't. He feels like a barely sketched out version of the character, retaining details like his inability to pass the engineer's exam and his drive for power without any connective tissue that held the character together. Here, he has about as much substance as the light he is made out of, and the worst casualty of this is the back and forth between him and Lister. On the UK program, this tension is the driving force of the show. The two trade insults and generally hate each other, yet share a bizarre companionship that inexplicably works for them. In the US pilot, there is no hint of that. The show tells us they've served together for a while, but you get no hint of that in the performances whatsoever. It just feels so flat, and it's almost painful to watch. On a cosmetic point, it's odd to me that they replaced Rimmer's H with what appears to be a bicycle reflector. I'm guessing it was a cost-cutting measure, but it's a shame nonetheless. I honestly feel like Hinton Battle could have been a pretty decent cat. He wouldn't have been on the caliber of Danny John Jules, but he would have been pretty alright I reckon. Unfortunately, he's not written nearly as well as the original cat is. It looks to me as if the writers of the US pilot were basing the cat less on actual cats and more doing a caricature of the character of the cat from the UK program, which means that he loses a bit of the feline attributes that the character is supposed to have. Admittedly, this is a sin also committed by the latter half of the UK show, but it's concerning that the US pilot does this from the word go. There are a couple of mildly amusing jokes, such as him playing with string and being introduced wailing on a box as if you were a cat on a fence, but most of it is just rehashing jokes from the UK show that were much better told there, which is a sin committed by this pilot a lot. It's interesting to me that Robert Llewellyn is the only one who got carried over from the original to this pilot, and as a result he's the funniest person on this episode. There aren't too many differences between how the original Crichton and the US Crichton are played as a result, but the writing does hold Llewellyn back a bit. First of all, Crichton being in the US pilot at all somewhat clutters the whole affair. It has the strange result of the Lister Crichton friendship being moved to the forefront of the pilot, which comes at the expense of developing the relationship between Lister and Rimmer. This already isn't a good move, but it's made somewhat worse by the fact that there's absolutely no substance to the Lister Crichton friendship at all. They meet in the hallway, and instantly Crichton is willing, and apparently able, to lie to the captain about the whereabouts of Lister's cat for him. It's a very strange decision, and it makes the character of Crichton a lot less consistent, and therefore not nearly as engaging despite Llewellyn's best efforts. They also for some reason felt the need to change Crichton's full name from Crichton 2x4b523p to Crichton 2xb517p, a detail we learn when they show Horn in the jerky middle name joke from the last day. Well, my full name is Crichton 2xb517p, although I don't really like the 2xb part. I think it's a rather jerky middle name. <laughs> Personally, I don't much like the 2x4b. I, I think it's a jerky middle name. <laughs> Still, it could be worse. I once knew an android whose middle name was 2q4b. Oh, poor sucker. This is such a bizarre detail to change, I can't imagine why they bothered. I actually don't mind Jane Leaves as Holly. It's my personal opinion that Frasier is the funniest show to come out of the USA, so seeing Daphne as the slightly mad computer is actually pretty amusing. She carries the role well for what's given to her, which is admittedly mostly crap and she's one of the highlights of this program, and I reckon with a better script she might have had a chance of playing the character decently. So let's have a look over this episode, shall we? The US pilot begins with a new title sequence, which is shoddily put together using footage from the first four series of the UK show, an extremely hackneyed futuristic typeface, and a theme track that lacks all the grandness of the series 1-2 to two theme or the energy of the series 3 onwards theme, instead sounding like something that would be well at home on Garth Marenghi's Dark Place. <laughs> Right off the bat, we have an idea about how good this show is going to be. Holly briefly introduces the ship to us as a voiceover, some stock photos, then moves on to explaining her function, reusing the PET to jerk from the UK series. I have an operating IQ of 6,000, the same IQ as 6,000 PE teachers. I am Holly, the ship's computer with an IQ of 6,000 the same IQ as 6,000 PE teachers. And telling the audience how holograms work, a far less interesting introduction to the idea than the George McIntyre subplot from the episode of the original program this one mostly borrows from. We are now introduced to Crichton, who in this version is joining Red Dwarf on the beginning of one of their mining missions. There's a cute little exchange between him and his spearhead, which I genuinely think with a bit more polish is a gag that might have fit in with the original show. Boy, I hate backseat drivers. We are now introduced to Lister and Rimmer in a scene that takes the basic concept of the opening of the end and then cuts it up entirely. Here, Rimmer verbally abuses a scutter, which does seem to be more functional than the UK props admittedly. Lister is given Todd Hunter's line about the fact that Rimmer only outranks one person on the ship, and the scutters too apparently, which somewhat knackers the joke on the end about the scutters having a better union than Lister and Rimmer, and then they launch right into the spiel about how Rimmer always fails the engineer's exam. There's absolutely none of the hilarious back and forth that the characters had in the original UK episode. The conversation 
conversation here functioning less as character development and more as a vehicle for exposition. Also, Lister's matter-of-fact description of Rimmer's panic attack seems, I don't know, mean-spirited? It's definitely not as funny as the I am a fish joke. It's the same every time. You go in there, you read the questions, you have a major anxiety attack, and you faint. Lister, last time I only failed by the narrowest of narrow margins. You what? You walked in there, Rose. I am a fish. 400 times with a funny little dance and fainted. At that point, Crichton enters the scene and Rimmer uses the novelty condom joke from the backwards, but somehow succeeds in making it a lot less funny. What kind of robot are you? You look like a gigantic novelty condom. He then dashes off to restock the weenies on the captain's deck, hardy har, leaving Lister and Crichton to get acquainted. Lister explains how he got into deep space, a story that involves the fourth moon of Saturn, as if it's so hard to actually name one of Saturn's moons. Then we're introduced to this version of Christine Kachansky, who immediately dumps Lister on account of his complete lack of ambition. Lister responds to this by being a blithering idiot, and Kachansky leaves. The episode cuts to Lister in his quarters, where there's a somewhat amusing joke about Crichton popping in just to say, aww. And then and Lister explains to him his plan to live in a farm with Kachansky and Fiji, which seems at odds with the Lister who wants to drift around that Kachansky dumped two minutes ago. The episode seems to be pulling from both the book and the TV series simultaneously, but given that book and series Lister are motivated slightly differently, this just muddles the character. The captain of Red Dwarf announces to the ship there's an animal on board, and like a complete idiot, Lister reveals to Crichton that the animal is his cat and asks him to hide it. There is a lame joke about how they eat cats on Titan and that's why Lister bought her, and an even lamer joke about the fact that Lister thought Frankenstein was male and was just fat instead of pregnant. Though the episode jarringly moves on to Rimmer going into his engineer's exam, a scene that proves that the word smeghead is nowhere near as funny with an American accent, and, smeghead. and Lister is summoned to the drive room to be interrogated by the captain about the cat. They reuse the joke from the UK episode about cutting up the cat to have a test run. What would happen if I gave it to you? <laughs> I'd have it cut up and run tests on it. Well, with all due respect, Captain, what's in it for the cat? What would you do with Frankenstein? I'd send it down to the medical center and I'd have it cut up and test run on it. Would you put it back together when you'd finished? <laughs> Lister, the cat would be dead. So with respect, sir, what's in it for the cat? Kryzen is interrogated too, under the understanding that his programming would make him tell the truth, but inexplicably he's able to fight the programming enough already to be able to comically explode his eyeballs into the captain's coffee, leading to another lame one-liner. You know, in certain countries that's considered a delicacy. Lister is placed into stasis by the hologram first officer, and Lister is frozen for three million years. When he comes out, Holly tells him about the accident, and there's a mildly amusing joke about Lister not knowing the meaning of the word lethal. The entire crew was subjected to a lethal dose of cadmium too. Is everyone okay? <laughs> Everybody's dead, Dave. That's what lethal means. They also reuse a jerk from Holly about the remains of Kachansky, but it doesn't quite land here. I'm afraid she can't be part of your plan anymore. Well, I mean, unless it freezes up and you need something to grit the walkway. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, she won't be much use to you on Fiji now. Not unless it snows and you need something to grit the path with. <laughs> From here, the episode mostly follows the same beats as the end. Rimmer is reintroduced as a hologram, and the two meet the cat. Although here the cat is found in the cargo deck, and Holly explains the history of the cat people using an incredibly crappy animation. However, this episode completely omits the detail of the cat's religion being based on the story of Lister being put in stasis, which makes sense as it probably would have been too clever an idea for this script. The crew returns to the drive room, where they are visited by future versions of Lister, the cat, Crichton, and Kachansky, which seems to be a setting up a get the girl storyline for the prospective series, which would have been a fatally boring trope for the show to fall back on. This visitation spurs Lister to try and return the ship to Earth, and Red Dwarf shoots into space, bringing adventures for the crew that will never be seen. Oh, and before the episode is truly over, they quickly ape Holly's additionals from series 1 and 2, which now serve as Holly's diary as a sort of final joke for the episode. I imagine had the series been picked up, this would have been a thing for every episode, but here it's just used as a teaser as to what's going to come into the following episodes, which will of course never happen. To the surprise of nobody at all, this pilot tested very poorly. In fact, the US audiences who found it through the power of the internet, the target audiences, hated it, and frequently informed the cast of the original show as much at conventions and stuff. Years later, even Craig Bianco, who played Lister in this pilot, admitted that this pilot had been a terrible piece of work and believed himself to be sorely miscast in the role of Lister. All in all, this pilot is a relic of the past, a curiosity, and another in a long list of cautionary tales about remaking other shows for an American audience. However, this was not the only time an American Red Dwarf has attempted, as not long after the first pilot, the project was remounted this time under the control of Grant and Naylor.